it is your buddy peace and harmony with you here today much love going out to all the beautiful empowered harmonizers and we're zooming in and focusing in a little bit more in depth on a great viewer question and that is to really look at the manipulation of a covert narcissist and some of the tactics that they might use specifically as that of underreacting um, as a manifestation or a result of a personality who has a lack of empathy so someone who really just does not care who does not give a darn who is, does not have the ability to understand connect to and relate to and sort of resonate or respond to and sort of live with you in your feelings in what we call as empathy so that's a personality characteristic or trait a quality meaning an ability really to connect with others and be with them in their feelings and really sort of help them process be with you there that's what really healthy relationships are about <clears throat> but and then of course the deleterious or negative effects of that but before we get started I want to give a huge shout out to those of you who have recently made a donation to the channel thank you so much for your contribution your kind words it's an honor and a privilege to be able to help and be with you as a tool, a resource, and a support place and community to help you understand and process these things. And oftentimes, you're like the only one in the group. You're the only one in the crowd. You're being ostracized, isolated, gaslighted, and hyper-criticized, scapegoated. And no one is really sort of there for you. It can be a very scary, bewildering, and confusing situation to find your life really running amok, especially when <clears throat> there is a smear campaign against you or the numbers are against you. In other words, <clears throat> excuse me, meaning that the number of people in your family are sort of, um, you know, up against you. No one is really there for you. The, the dysfunction is running the family system. And this does happen where dysfunction tends to perpetuate itself in a family and that is what's really running the family engine or running the relationship engine and then running your life engine and you find yourself not really wanting to be where your relationship or your family is heading um, you find that it really is um, uh, excuse me here it's really sort of you know taking you on a wrong path um, you're not really finding that you're you know, it's just, it's habituated the way people then tend to react, especially in dysfunctional relationships, they tend to be more reactive. Um, and it's, you know, it's the negative tone. It's the lack of empathy. It's the feeling of superiority that I'm right, you're wrong. I'm better, you're less than. This is ego, egoic dysfunction. The ego separates things from bad versus good. Um, it is the judgmental place. Whereas you get... <clears throat> with the super ego and that is like as Freud said it's sort of your your conscience telling you giving you moral sense moral principle and when we um, talk about really um, narci uh, covert narcissism and there's a specific manipulation tool which is that I feel as of underreacting acting as if it's a, a, a very sort of um, almost to the point of ridiculing your experience, minimizing, um, and also the sense that um, they are, you know, it's just sort of making it superfluous or it just does not matter. And that is that of underreacting to your experience, your feelings, just very nonchalant as if, you know, you just told them you have a specific, you know, wound, hurt, this hurts my feelings, um, this is not right, um, this is my feeling here. And they're just looking at you like, oh, like they just don't respond. They don't have a connection. Their, a lack of empathy is then rampant in the relationship. And this, I feel, is one of the most covert ways of really sort of being a very hurtful, yet unrecognizable, but yet running rampant, meaning it's ongoing, but it's undetected. It's um, it, it is not monitored. It is not enforced. So, for example, <clears throat> you know, um, right now in the news, it's all sorts of stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Catholic Church and how all this um, sexual abuse is going on, but it's undetected. 70 years of cover-up. 
So this is a covert, this is an example for you to understand what covert um, systems are like. In other words, it's undetected, it's under the radar, it's not obvious, but it is going on, and this is what it means to run rampant. It is ongoing, undetected, and you know, the system, it just keeps going. The pain and the abuse, you know, most horrifically to young children who are vulnerable, defenseless, they don't know how to stand up for themselves. They don't know what's right or wrong. Their thinking brain is not mature enough, yet they are being forced into very uncomfortable situations. And this is covert problems. Um, this is undetected. And so um, in a covert relationship, specifically that of lack of empathy, meaning that there's an underreaction, there's uh, a sort of acting as if it's it does not matter, that it's a passing irrelevant experience and so you go on feeling ignored um, you go on feeling shut down but go on you do and meanwhile this repetition and experience creates a deeper and deeper void or feeling of emptiness or feeling like something is askew so then your life then follows what I call that negative orderly direction thinking feeling and behaving and then as Dr. Joe Dispenza says feelings repeated over days becomes a mood, mood repeated over days becomes a temperament, temperament repeated over months and months and months becomes a characteristic or a personality identity, and then next thing you know, you're relating to the victim. I am a victim. I am unhappy. I am um, having problems. I'm having issues. I am unhappy. Your identity becomes then wrapped up or defined by this dysfunctional relationship. And so you find yourself then in a trauma bond, inextricably connected, and then oftentimes married or in a familial sense where there's this covert problem and there is no taking responsibility or being able, especially when there's numbers going against you, numbers in the family, or years of this you know, occurring, and then this person just is underreactive, irresponsive, irresponsible, not taking accountability for this. It's just in one ear out the other. There is no, I am sorry. There is no, let me listen. There is no, um, really, you know, um, I'm sorry, you know, what can we change? There is no changing of, of the relationship dynamic. There is no changing. And then within you, you then become uh, unhappy and then really off course of where your life could be. And so really it's all about getting back on course with you. The you that's been there you know, since inception, since you were a baby baby, you know, since you were an infant, since you were, you know, two months old, your, your, your divine self, really that is part of you that is making you human. This is a divine, it's a, a divine place within you, which inextricably through all the abuse has been there and has been like a witness. So it's like the witness protection program is within you that's saying, I have to um, you know, drug myself through this. I have to protect myself. I have to numb myself out. I have to overeat. I have to overspend. I have to overdrug. I have to overdrink. These, of course, become then lifestyles. And it's to, it keeps you on the same path, though. That is the problem with covert relationships. And then this wound that becomes then internalized. So you need to get rid of that I am a victim mentality. You need to get that out of your feeling center, your physiology, your neurotransmitters that are literally, you know, caught up and then repeating that. Your mind and your body tends to repeat this pattern. So you need to do a pattern interrupt. You need to go, whoa, you need to get some space between the events that have created this emotion and this dysfunction. It is okay to say, I no longer want to be connected and part of this dysfunctional pattern. I am, you know, taking a step out. You know, I am getting a divorce. I am no longer perpetuating this. Even if you need to strike out on your own, strike out on your own. You will, you must, and you are setting path in the in the right direction. You don't need to be set, you know, you don't need to perpetuate the sabotage. You don't need to have a stigma about it. You don't need to have a judgment. I'm a failure. I'm a divorcee. I'm a da 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 da. You don't need to go around that negative orderly direction thinking. You need to use your role of metacognition and you need to define it in the positive. 
I am free. I am emotionally liberated. I am on a new life. I have a fresh start. Today is a new day. I am so excited. I am so exhilarated. I am liberated. But peace and harmony, how can I be happy that I'm getting divorced? This is the most traumatic part time of my life. You can still be energized by the positive and resonate and focus in the opportunity. Liberating your prefrontal cortex, the part of you that has the ability to dream, decide, make new choices, go new places, that is your prefrontal cortex and that is the area, that is the positive early direction thinking, that is the healing place that you want to live in, especially if you've been in a rampant relationship that has been tinged and tainted with lack of empathy. Who cares if this person is six feet ten, seven feet four, two foot nine, whatever it is, who cares about who and what they are? All that matters is you. You need to pull the importance back to you and bring it back within your realm of feeling. I am important. I am significant. I am intelligent. I have abilities. I have profoundly important abilities which have been with me through time, which have been numbed out or discarded or devalued, and I'm reclaiming them now. Just because you don't have the ability to put up with abuse doesn't make you a lesser person. Just because you don't have the ability to be silenced and be walked over, you don't have that ability anymore. That might have been an esteemed ability when you're in a relationship with a narcissist or a psychopath. To turn a deaf ear, to turn a numb cheek, to turn a blind eye to the abuse, to allow it to go forth, to be shut down. Perhaps that was the ability that you had adopted just like in, you know, in, uh, you know, in depression times you learn to pickle and you learn to can vegetables in order to survive. That might have been a skill no longer is the skill needed for you to perpetuate the feeling of being abused. You don't need to turn, now that you've grown, now that you know better, now that you're becoming aware and you don't like where things are headed, it's important for you to say, I'm no longer tolerating this. I'm no, this is no longer the lifestyle. I'm not living in the bunker. I'm not living in the basement. I'm not living in the shadow of my abilities. I'm no longer living as if something is about to blow up and the dysfunction is about to get worse because things don't stay stagnant. They either get worse or they get better. So it is enough to say that yes, I am, I am reclaiming my inner I am and I will deserve better and I will do whatever is required to get there. So if it means getting a mediator, speaking with a lawyer, speaking with someone who will listen to you, take notes, take note of what you've been through, saying, I get it, I can help you, I am here for you, I am your bridge to the better life, we are going to make this happen and everything is going to be okay. It is traumatic, yes, it's difficult, yes, it's painful, but yes, it is liberating, yes, you can get through the psychological warfare, really what is ensuing when you, um, uh, uh, you know, originally make this assertion, you make this decision, <clears throat> it's, it can be bewildering. But you need to, you know, be able to take your own helm, hence the recovery date, hence the recovery journal, hence the recovery gift. You need to have a physical talisman. You need to have a mentor. These are all parts of the recovery uh, in the book that I am working on. These are really important parts that I am giving you basically sneak peek because I want to be here real time for you and create the video content because to me, to be an orator on this is something that I enjoy and it's something I want to, I feel can be readily available while I'm working on the book, which is a lot of work, which is curating, it's, but I have the system. So number one, you, you know, when you are in this sort of underreactive relationship where they could just give a care less, you could tell them you have this severe diagnosis, you have this wound, you are, you know, you don't find this very funny when people are ganging up. They're minimizing your feelings. They're uh, basically um, telling you that you, you know, they're, they're basically not giving you empathy. This is what lack of empathy looks like on a covert way. You need to be able to identify it, put words 
to the experience. You need to understand that this is not normal. This is drama. You want your life to get back to normal, to get back where everything is okay, where you know, you're going with the flow. You are feeling happy. It is not a guilty, you know, so much of religion or so much of dysfunction makes it a sin basically to be happy. It makes it a sin to feel good about yourself. It's a sin to have self-love or to be able to communicate, you know, you are meant to be a martyr or you're meant to feel that you can't develop that happiness. You can't indulge in that. <clears throat> There can be a lot of then self-limiting beliefs which then hold you back and keep you stuck <clears throat> in these abusive relationships. So you do need to have a mentor. You do need to have someone who you look up to to then repattern and sort of keep like a lighthouse in your life that you can look to to know that your gifts are valuable. Your experience is important. Your feelings are truth. You know, you, you are not made to feel an untruth. That your truth will truly set you free despite the dysfunction that runs these relationships, these dysfunctional relationships that tells you your truth are lies, your truth are hypersensitivity, your needs are um, unrealistic. That, you know, and then if you're stuck in that dysfunction, you can't connect with a mentor. You can't connect. You can't grow. You're becoming like a drowning. You're drowning emotionally. There is no life jacket in a dysfunctional relationship. They're going to perpetuate and they're going to proliferate the dysfunction. They're going to continue along that negative orderly direction of thinking, feeling, and behaving. And they're just going to basically laugh, laugh and scoff if you try to say, you know, this is not right. And you're trying to sort of fix you're trying to fix a dysfunction and you don't have the tools. You're looking at a you know a broken airline engine and you have a car wrench. Like you can't fix this. It's it's you you might as well you know say I'm not going to fix this person. Otherwise, to do it is to set me up, and it's an exercise in futility, and it's only going to make the matter worse. So you need to separate yourself from the feeling that I'm going to work harder. I'm going to fix this. It just ain't going, it ain't going, it ain't going to fix. You know, you can't connect the wires. You cannot change someone who lives with a lack of empathy. That's who they are. That's who they're going to be. You let them go in love and light. And then you surround yourself with people who aren't like this. In other words, people who do have empathy, people who can stop and listen, people who can help you chart a new course, people who can help you articulate and write down what success looks like what a happy relationship looks like, what the good life looks like for you. Oftentimes that means going, wow, the good life to me doesn't mean getting, you know, shit face drunk every, every day, every week. The, the good life to me doesn't mean going upside down financially. The good life to me means reading and pursuing intellectual pursuits. The good life to me means having quiet time. The good life to me means being safe. The good life to me means having a hug. The good life to me means being able to have a puppy or a kitten. The good life to me means being able to go for a walk outdoors and enjoy the indulgence of nature. The good life to me means being able to be able to be uh, have a professional pursuit which is where I'm not laughed at, scoffed, and told me I will never make it. So the good life to me means living free of the censor, living free of the criticizer, living free of that which is now, you know, when you're around oftentimes these dysfunctional individuals, and I know we have a lot of individuals who have been um, viewers who have been in relationships with those people who are psychopathic, who have basically, who live in a, a, a carefully designed persona which make them seem like the wife, which make them seem like the husband, which make them seem like the fiance, the boyfriend. And then you find, you know, that they have a double and triple life, um, that they have no emotional connection. It is all a plastered persona. It is all confabulated. It is all built for, in order to keep a specific relationship going. Yes, a marriage can be out of pretense and out of false a psychopath will get married and has no intention of being there for you. 
Um, they just do it out of convenience. They have now a title, a Mr. or Mrs. They have a ring. They have a house. They have a, you know, spouse for their kids, a pretense of normality. Meanwhile, out the back door, in the attic, down the street, in the next town, they're a completely different person. They're cheating. They're lying. They have different jobs. They're going on different vacations. They're blowing you up financially. <clears throat> they are, you know, taking you down emotionally little by little until things are what we call exposed. So, you know, it is very, very difficult and it is to understand that it is this lack of empathy which creates this underreaction and then feeling of disimportance. So that's really the cause that's created the effect. So number one and namely, you need to have empathy for yourself. So the change, even if you're not used to it, even if this is a new feeling, a new energy for you, healing is about having a new energy. It's about having new skills. It's about having a new I am. It's about having a new possibility. It's about having a new future ahead of you where it is what you enjoy. And if you follow that, the money will come, the happiness will come, the relationships will come. The finding out of who you are, it is all about self-discovery. Plato, know thyself. I mean, you know, philosopher that years have run through true to time and the ancients had their, their big coliseums with that written on the rafters <clears throat> in all the glorious stone, know thyself. You know, it's important, it, it seems so basic, but yet it is so profound. And you cannot know yourself when you're in a relationship with a covert narcissist. You're forever trying to get to know them, satisfy their needs, and you know, if it's really difficult, then you, you've got a number of covert narcissists where you're just becoming, as Dr. Craig Malkin says, an echoist. You're just trying to satisfy their needs. How can I cook their meal? How can I dress to please them? How can I get shoes so that they will notice? How can I get this so I will get their attention? You are becoming overly impressed or you know, becoming too impressed with the dysfunction trying to perpetuate that. What kind of car can I get so that they will notice me? How can I make myself more available so that I will become a winner in their eyes? <clears throat> How can I become more attractive? How can I better satisfy their needs? And meanwhile, you're being denied your own needs. So then this becomes the martyrdom, you know, the, uh, the sacrifice, you know, I am sacrificing my needs. I really should be studying, but instead I'm trying to, you know, uh, you know, get and satisfy this person's needs. So it becomes dysfunction. You become trauma bonded. You become engaged in behaviors, emotions, and choices, which are really not in your best interest. You're taking care of other people's needs where they should be able to take care of their own. The, the narcissist will surround themselves with people who are then able to satisfy their needs in this way. They have no qualms. They don't care that you're not able to go to college. They don't care that you're not able to focus. They don't care that you need guidance. They don't care that you need attention. They're just, they are underreactive. They, they, you know, you, as far as you, they're, they're concerned, you're on your own here, but yet you're giving them this very attention and need 24 seven, you've obligated your life to them, yet they're not giving the same in return. So then you're, you know, it's a double standard. You're giving to them what they can't give in return, but yet you're needing to receive what you're giving in return. You're, you do have needs. You do need to be able to receive. So the problem and the dysfunction of the covert narcissist relationship is that you end up over obligating, taking care of their needs. That is what runs like a lifeblood, a life, a lifeline through the relationship is that it's founded on you taking care of their needs. You become an I am, your identity becomes wrapped up in, in becoming this role to them. But yet, <clears throat> you are more than that. And then, especially then, again, it is to re realize that the empathy, the I am, needs to be embraced. So it is now that you're used to underreacting them because you then, kind of like through osmosis, you know, there's energetic relationships. You're energy will then become a counterforce to their force. So then you begin to um, absorb within that, you know, that sort of same underreaction. 
I need to study. I need to focus. I need quiet. I need love. I need affection. I need a back scratch. I need my feet massaged. I need some solutions. I need to be listened to. So oftentimes that those that inner voice of what you need then becomes under attended to, under reacted to. So you become like energetically to the covert narcissist. <clears throat> so reclaiming your healing, reclaiming your personal power, reclaiming your the good life, reclaiming you know your life purpose, and getting back on track back on the path, what I call positive early direction thinking, is to then be there in a new empathetic way for you. And then even if you've been putting this off, um, you know, that I need to grow myself intellectually, I need to grow myself in my heart, I need to own my experiences and saying no to the dysfunction. <clears throat> even though this might not be popular, uh, with the narcissist, the fact that you are no longer there for them. It might not be pos you know, you might not be popular in the eyes of the abusers. Well, excellent. Amen. That is great. I don't need to be popular to the abusers. I, I don't need to be well liked. That is, I'm letting go of that requirement. I don't need to be favorite, you know, the favorite in their eyes. I don't need their favoritism to feel good about myself. I don't need their approval. This is a huge burden oftentimes for people when they realize, whoa, I no longer need to over obligate and be responsible for their emotions. I am, that is, that is, you know, a, a sign of dysfunction to feel that you have to be responsible for their emotions and getting them stable. That is their responsibility. That is their problem. That is not your problem. When, you're, when you've been in a dysfunctional relationship, oftentimes you have absorbed them and their needs like a sponge. <clears throat> and then you squeeze in and out, in and out. It is all about their emotional needs. And then to the point where it becomes toxic, it becomes overwhelmed. It becomes, it's very, very difficult to sort it out. You know, this is yours, this is mine. So you need to understand what is yours. And there's a, a popular or interesting uh, technique which is used oftentimes by healer, which is having a rattle. Um, have you seen those? It's almost like what you call like a maracha or something. And um, in a lot of healing circles, they will um, give you, I, I don't know what it's called, but um, it's like a maracha or a rattle. And it's like a gourd that has little seeds. And they will shake that all around you. And you can then feel the shake and movement of these beads. And then it cleanses you and your aura and your inner field, your energetic field of their energy. And it's a very beautiful thing. In fact, it's a great tool. Um, and yes, I really do. I'm developing a lot of tools. There are a lot of tools that, you know, you can bring into that are from ancient cultures, from the shamanic traditions or the Native American traditions. Uh, the Buddhist traditions, things that really can be very applicable and useful. So you can, I don't have one, um, but I can get one and show you, you know, you can have someone sort of clear your energy space. So you need to clear your energy space oftentimes of this, you know, downtrodden or depressed feeling. The people who just go, oh, like they, you know, they're under reactive, they're under responsive to your needs. So you need to then embrace and then listen to and oftentimes vision, have a vision of um, all senses when I talk about resensitizing you need to write down your needs you need to get them in written form because when they're there on the page it really comes to life it's like it's like having your own best friend going hey wow guess what you just wrote down I need a hug I need to be listened to I need someone who is self-sufficient I need someone who does not criticize me and then you go, whoa, and then someone is able to, you know, respond that back to you with empathy. And all of a sudden you go, aha, I have this aha moment. I have an awakening. And you then see how this person is falling well, way short of your needs. And you've been overindulging them and trying to take care of them. You can't keep that going anymore. That is a burden which is on you like a dead weight. Go to the forest and try to drag around a 30 pound log and see how long you can enjoy that. It becomes, it holds you back. Literally, you, you need to understand physiologically what it feels like to be held back because 
that gives you a vision or an image. It's just like back in the day when Oprah lost all her weight and then she had like 60 pounds of chicken in a bag that she was then showing what she was then dragging around. That is what emotional weight feels like, emotional dead weight. It's like emotional deadwood. You are pulling it along. Go get a bag of 60, you know, 60 pounds of chicken and pull that around with you. That is like what over, you know, people who have a lot of weight to lose, that's literally what they're calling, you know, and then that's why their legs are so strong because they're literally over, like bench pressing 60 pounds from their gut because they are so fat. <clears throat> that is what emotional weight feels like, emotional dead weight. When someone has not validated and responded to and has had empathy with your feelings. And this is especially profound if this has occurred during your formative years, during your childhood, during your especially crucial, your teenage years, 13 to 19, 20 to 27. I mean, there are certain age bands where you need to be around people of empathy. Otherwise, you find you're swimming in the wrong crowd. And then the wrong crowd leads to more of the wrong crowd and they're going amok, you know, you don't want to get emotionally drowned down with them. So you have to say, you know, sorry, partner, got to go. Elvis is, you know, leaving the building. And then when, with time, you'll realize how dysfunctional they are, the trouble that they're getting into, the mayhem. And then you can say, wow, I did make a good call. I made a good decision by leaving that dysfunction, by saying no to the abuse. I will not tolerate this sort of verbalization. I will not tolerate this criticism. You do not need to tolerate it as much as it might perpetuate and continue and you know this seems like the new normal to you. You've got your head in the wrong place if you know what I mean. You're, you've lost the forest for the trees. You've lost perspective. So you need to get the frame of reference and then know that it's okay to work on the new I am and then to have a mentor. Getting back under being, you know, tools for this or having, use the recovery journal as a sounding board for your needs. I need a talent. I need, you know, to be safe. I need to be at peace. I need the good life. I need income. I need someone who does not depend on my income. <clears throat> I need someone who does not yell at me. I need someone who does not sneer at me. You know, especially during your teenage years, these are the formative years, and if you did not have sort of the lighthouse, you need to reclaim a new lighthouse. You need to have a new rock in your life. You need to go and create that and find that on your own. This is like, ah, you know, it is, it is what will liberate you. If you find a new religion, a new book, a new channel, a new podcast, a new talent, a new meetup group, meetup.com, you know, a new counselor, a new therapist, a new therapy style, um, something that you are now doing to engage. The time is now. I'm making 